This is part of a tutorial trilogy I'm making. And in this video you learn how to make a sorting visualizer like those you probably have seen online. In some of them the visualizer also sings. So I'll teach you how to do that as well. We'll code everything from scratch using basic HTML, CSS and JavaScript. And I'll focus more on modern JavaScript techniques this time, so by the end of this video you'll learn all sorts of new things. Get it? All sorts? Because we're gonna... No, 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 no! Gonna code, debug and have fun Coding with Radu Coding with Radu Gonna prototype and design Coding with Radu Coding with Radu Let's code now We begin with basic HTML. In the head I will write the title for the page and I will also create a link to a style sheet. We will need to use CSS a little bit. So style CSS I will need to create this file in a second and the body is going to have a title that I want to be visible on the page so I'll use this h1 tag and I'll write here sorting visualizer again and the animation is going to happen in a div this time I will give this an ID of container like this and we will write our JavaScript code in a separate script file called script.js Now let me create these files. I'll go right here and say style.css and script.js and I'll begin to write the JavaScript code. I'll sort a number of 10 elements to begin with at least and use an array to hold 10 different values. This array will have random values uh, from 0 to 1. So I will just use the math random function here, like so. And let's quickly debug what we have until now, see if everything works. So I will log this array in the console. And when I refresh the page, we see the page has a title visible here in the browser tab and then also visible inside of the page itself in the h1 tag. And here in the console, I have 10 elements, an array of 10 different elements, every one of them between zero and one randomly generated. Instead of showing them in the console, I'm going to go back here, remove this log and use a for loop to add them as individual bars on the page. I will create one of these bars like this using the create element method of the document and I will just make them as simple divs like so. I will set the style of these bars so that the height is going to be equal to the value of the array times 100 and I will concatenate this percent value. So I want these bars to be a percent of the height of the container therein. Now, to be visible, I'll also have to add the width for these bars, let's say 10 pixels, and uh, also let's give it the background color, let's make them all black, and add each of these bars to the container with the append child function, like so. Now, if I'm going to refresh this page, nothing seems to happen, apparently. But if we look inside of these elements and open up this container div right here, you see that the bars are there. They do have different heights as a percent value and a width and the background color of black. But this container 
is not visible. It doesn't have yet a width and a height. So I can give it a height of, for example, 200 pixels, like so. And now inside of this container, we can actually see individual bars, but they are not one next to each other how we expected. They are actually one under each other. And to fix that, we can use um, Flex Display, for example. And I'm going to change this to Display Flex. And the default direction is horizontally, so that's good. But I would like to align these items using Flex End, which will make them align at the bottom like this. Now, this is something that I'm going to need to copy inside of our style CSS and give it to our container. So I will write it like this. And now I'm accessing here the container by ID. That's what this hashtag is for. And when I refresh the page now, I see that these bars have varying lengths and randomly generated every time I refresh and the container looks decent. But I don't like that these elements are aligned to the left like this. I would like them to be centered. And I'm going to do that by changing the style of this body element. I will also give it a display of flex and align items to center. But uh, I would like to have the direction column this time. So flex direction. So they are one under the other. Let's copy this and assign it to the body here in our CSS file. So body, and I don't need to use a hashtag here. I'm referring to the one and only body element. And now when we refresh, we get this new layout as we expected. Now, when we look at these bars right here, we notice that all of them have the same width and background color. So we could use a CSS class here instead. I'm going to copy these properties and define a class here like this. Paste these and in the JavaScript code here, I'm going to write class list add our bar class that we just defined in CSS. Now the end result is going to be the same pretty much, but these properties now come from the bar class. And we could change all of the bars at once if we play around here in the console, for example. Like if we want to add a margin, say one pixel, then all of them are affected at the same time. And I think this looks much better. So I'm gonna copy this margin back inside of our CSS file, add it to this bar right here. And in JavaScript here, the only thing that is different about the bars is their height, as it should be. Now, let's implement a sorting algorithm. And I'm going to do that here and implement bubble sort. This is pretty much exactly what you will find on Wikipedia if you look for the pseudocode of the bubble sort algorithm. I'm not going to go into details about it just yet. Uh, I will explain it later uh, because I want to use what we create today as a kind of explanatory material, so teaching material. So I will just write it now pretty much following what the pseudocode says, but in JavaScript. And here I'm using this uh, destructuring assignment to swap the elements. So I don't actually need another swap function like it is there. And I'm uh, replacing that repeat until with the do while. So here I need to have the um, Boolean value opposite. Now, if I refresh this, I see a sorted array. So it's visualizing the sorting, the sorted array, definitely, but not the sorting process. Every time we refresh, we get the array of random values that are sorted but I would like to animate this process next. And to control the animation, we're gonna use two buttons. So we go back to the HTML page here, and 
let's add a separator like this. And inside the div, I'm going to define a button for initializing this array. So I want to also generate new arrays without refreshing the page. And it's going to call a function called init. We'll have to define that. And another button with play, which will play the animation. So these are going to be changes we do here. And inside of the JavaScript file, I'm going to refactor things a little bit. So here, what happens at the top is the init function, actually. So function init, like so. Let's arrange these things. And every time we initialize this array, I also want to show the bars. So let me do this now. And our show bars function will be here. Function show bars. Like so. Now bubble sort right here, it's its own function. And I will give a parameter here array. We might want to sort different arrays in the future. I don't think we will in this video, but it's a good idea to pass parameters usually. Even these functions should get information like what bars are you showing from which array. But this is a global variable and a simple project this time, so we'll leave it as such. Now this bubble sort will be called inside of the play function, which we also need to define. So the other button in the interface calls this function, which is going to bubble sort the array and show bars for now. Let's refresh the page and nothing here. But if we press init, we get now our uh, randomly distributed bars. And if I'm going to press play, something happens. We get more bars instead. They are actually the same bars from here, like this one is this one, and this one here is this one, and so on. They are sorted, but they are appended to this div. So what we need to do is empty the container every time we are showing the bars to avoid this problem. Otherwise, every time we press play, we just add more things there. So inner HTML set this to empty before we show the bars init play. And now it's going to init play, init, 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 init play. Looks very good. Only thing I want to do is when I refresh, I want to automatically call this init function. So up here, I'm going to write init like this. I don't want to have to press this button every time I refresh the page. Now, if we look at this algorithm right here for doing the bubble sort, many people animate this by breaking the algorithm apart. And it's definitely one way to do it. But the problem is that then the algorithm is somehow split into multiple chunks and it can become confusing as to what this is. And adapting the same strategy to other algorithms is going to be difficult. Instead, I'm going to show you a trick where we record the swaps that are going to happen. So these are the only times where the array is changing. And this is what I want to record. What should be moved where? And I'm going to do this in a variable here, which I call swaps as an empty array. And here where we're actually doing the change, I will say swaps push an array with i minus one and i. So these are the two things, the two indices that are going to be swapped. And this is what I will record in this swaps array. And at the end of this bubble sort function, I will return swaps like so. So we didn't change anything about the algorithm. We didn't divide it into parts. We just added this kind of logging mechanism, if you will, so that it keeps track of all the changes that have happened. And now we're going to access these here, like this, and animate these swaps instead. So animate swaps. 
and I'm going to create an animate function right here, which is going to be something like this. So given the swaps as parameter, if these are empty, so if there are no swaps in this array, then we just return. We are done animating. Otherwise, I'm just going to use the structuring assignment here to get the value for i and j of the first element in the swaps. I actually don't need this here. So the shift method takes out the first element of the swaps array. And instead of assigning that element to a swap variable, I'm destructuring it so that i and j are going to be the indices of that first swap. So the ones that we are adding here, like i minus 1 and, and i, they are now going to be referred to as i and j. And what the animation will do is swap the values of those indices like this and show the bars after the update. And then we are going to call this animate function again with a timeout. So I'm going to write here a function call of animate with the swaps after the change. So after we took this one swap out from there. And let's just use 50 milliseconds as the timeout. So every 50 milliseconds we get an update in the animation. Now let's save this file, refresh. And when I press play, something crazy happened. So the problem is immediately after you press play, you get the array sorted already. And that's because we called here bubble sort on the array, and then it sorted all the values already. It tells us also what the swaps are, what will need to be swapped, but the array is already sorted. So I would need to sort another array, not the one given, a copy of that array so that the one that we animate on doesn't change. And I can easily do that by saying here, copy is equal to, and now I'm going to create a new array by spreading this array that we get as a global variable. And we're going to do the bubble sort on this copy instead. So now the swaps that we get from sorting this copy of the array will be applied on the original array and our animation is going to be like this. So now we actually get the process. Each change in the array is animated every 50 milliseconds. But this is still not a great teaching tool, at least, because there is not much emphasis going on. And maybe also the speed is too high. We'll, we'll check that later. Now what I would like to do is emphasize which things are being swapped. So inside of our show bars function, I would like to pass the indices that are changing. So in this case, I will write here i and j as an array. I want to have a sim single, uh, a single parameter here. And here I'm going to say indices. So if these indices exist, and if they include i. So now I'm checking here when showing the bars, if the ith bar, the one that we are currently displaying, is in this indices array. So if it's the one that is being swapped at the moment. And if it is, I'm going to set the background color of this bar to red, like this. Now, refreshing this, if I press play, you see that the things that have swapped, that are swapping, are emphasized with the red color. At the end here, I would like to actually show the array one more time without this emphasis. So I'm going to go here where this return value is, and I will write show bars without any 
parameter. Because if we send no parameter here, then indices will be undefined, so this will not execute, and all the bars will just be the default black color. Right, so now we see all the things that are changing emphasized in red color, and um, at the end, the array is left as such. Let's try to add more elements here. Let's set n to 20 and maybe slow this down a bit. Like um, here, let's use 200 milliseconds for each swap. It looks nice and you can start to see a little bit why this is called bubble sort. Let me show you. So check it out. When we get to this element right here, it's going to be bubbled up all the way to the top here in the first iteration. So now you can see it moving all the way there. And that happens for all the biggest elements first. So we always take the largest element that we find when we sweep across the array and move it towards the end. And I guess that's why it's called bubble sort. But it's still not a very good teaching material because it does show here the swap when it happens, but it doesn't show the move that is going to happen, like the comparison itself. We can also update our code to show that part as well. But then here we are not recording the swaps anymore. We are recording the moves, like comparing the items and the swap. They are both a kind of move. So what I'm going to do here is actually replace in this whole document the word swaps. I will press Ctrl H in Visual Studio Code and I will replace swaps with moves like this. And here, each move is going to contain something else this time. It's not going to be an array as such. It's going to be an object with two items, indices. So the index i minus 1 and i are still going to be uh, part of an array. And then the second thing is going to be the type of the move. So in this case, the type of the move is going to be swap. Let me just add these in one line. It's uh, easier to see the whole code like that. Now, this move here says which indices are involved in the move and what type of move it is. It is a swap. I'm going to copy this before we do the comparison and replace the type here with comp, like short for comparison. And uh, Essentially, I'm recording this move twice when I'm doing a comparison that will provoke a swap. But it's okay, I think it will help with the explanation. Now, this changes some things. Here, where we get this move, we are going to say the move, the first move is stored in this move constant. But then I still want those indices. So the i and j indices are obtained like this, move.indices. And I will do this swap right here only if this move was a swap. So if move type is a swap, then do the swap like so. And when showing the bars, I want to emphasize a little bit differently the swaps and the comparisons. So I'm just going to pass here the whole move object instead of these indices, like this. And now inside of this show bars, I don't have the indices here, I have the move. So what I'm going to do here is check if there is a move and the move indices include i then the background color is going to change according to the move 
type. So I'm going to write here move type is equal to swap. So if it is a swap, then I will return the red color. Otherwise, let's make it blue. So I'm using here the ternary operator to set the background color to red if the move type is a swap, otherwise set it to blue. Let's save this file and refresh the page. Play. Okay, this is much better. It's still a little bit fast as a teaching tool maybe, but for someone who already knows a little bit about this algorithm, it's quite clear what it's doing. If you really want to understand every step that happens here, I recommend searching for this animate function here and then in the source, every time we show the bars, after we show the bars and before calling the next timeout, set a breakpoint. And now when we refresh this and press play, it stops after each move that the algorithm does. So let's try to explain the algorithm now. And we can see here, um, the first thing it's doing, it starts at one. So I starts at one, which is actually right here. And it compares I minus one and I. So one and zero indices are checked to be compared. These ones are so that I minus one is not greater than that one, so no swap will happen. Let's just play. But in this case, when I is now two, and it compares to I minus one, which is one, so these two things are compared, this is larger than the other one, so it will swap. That means that our move will uh, add another element, which is of type swap, so it displays these same indices again after the swap. And the same thing goes on. Here we need to swap again because this is larger than the one on the right. And the same thing will happen over and over again. And this seems to be now the largest bar. So it will mean that a swap will happen for every comparison until this element reaches the end. And this is the so-called bubbling effect. I'll, I'll remove this breakpoint from here, press play, and see the rest of the animation at full speed. Which is kind of a slow speed, because I really want to have a fast visualizer this time. So let me go here where we have our animation and put it back to 50 like what we had previously. I want it to look like this one. And I want to add the sound as well. So let's go here at the top and get access to our audio context. I'll set this to null at first because user needs to interact with the page before defining an audio context. So I'll do this instantiation here in the play note function and I will play a note with the given frequency. So what happens here is I will check to see if I need to define this audio context. And if I do, then I will assign it to a new audio context object from the native web audio API. The problem is that some browsers don't have it there, so you need to write also these other conditions if you want to have it work on more browsers. So I'm done with getting the audio context here, and next I'm going to play a note for a very short duration, like 0.1 of a second, so 10% of a second. And this oscillator is going to be the object that we will use to play the sound. And I will set the frequency of this sound 
to the value coming from here, from the parameter. So we control what frequency this sound has with the parameter of the play note function. If you want to learn more about this web audio API, I was teaching it better in my visual web development course where I made that um, augmented reality piano. And also this melody maker tutorial is teaching it better, I think. But I won't focus it on it now. And um, instead, I just write here that I want to start this oscillator and let's stop this oscillator after the duration. So I'll add the duration here to the current time. And to hear anything, we need to connect this to the destination of the audio context. This is usually your speakers. Now I'm just going to refresh the page and test this function that we wrote here in the console. I need to listen as well. Okay, so there is some noise coming and if I change this, we get a different frequency. But if you go too low, you don't really hear anything anymore because the frequency is too low. So I kind of like this 200 to 700 range where we will need to interpolate between. So where we animate here, I'm going to call this play note function with the value of the array at i multiplied by 500 and adding 200 to it. So this is the linear interpolation function. I made a video about this earlier. Check it out if you want to learn how to write this more neatly and to understand why this works. But now I'm running a little bit out of time, so I'm just gonna leave it like this. And I'm actually going to play two sounds at the same time. So I'm going to do it like this, playing one note for this um, one bar and another note for the other bar in the array, like so. And if I test now, it's going to sound really horrible because these are going to play at maximum volume and overlapping each other. It's not going to be good on my ears. So I'm going to go back up here and define another node like this for controlling the gain. You can think of this as the, as the volume. And I will set this value to 0 0.1, like this. Now here where we connect to the destination, we don't want to actually connect the oscillator to the destination. We want to connect it to this node instead. And the node is going to be the one connected to the destination. So we're forming a kind of oriented graph here. And now if we refresh the page and press play, So there's a little bit of a clicking noise happening after every sound. And the reasons why that happens is hard to explain in this short video. But uh, if you check out the visual web development course or that Melody Maker tutorial, then you will find out. You can make it go away by typing here linear ramp to value at time. And this has to do with interpolation again. So we just want this gain to turn to zero by the end of the duration. And this will fix the problem. Let's see. I think I don't want to see all of these comparisons happening. So in the end, I'm just going to go here 
and not record this type of move anymore. I think the visualizer is just funnier without it, only emphasizing the swaps. Let's see. Okay, I like it. Let me just go here in index HTML and paste here some nice note emojis so that it's clear that this is a musical sorting visualizer. I'm wondering now if this could help, for example, people with uh, vision loss to understand sorting algorithms a little better. I mean, could you detect the sorting algorithm coming from this sound? Maybe you can make a game on that. <laughs> Maybe I'll try someday if you're interested. Let me know in the comments below and see you guys.